Chapter Eight of Tarzan of the Apes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Tarzan of the Apes by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter Eight: The Treetop Hunter. The morning after the dum-dum the tribe started slowly back through the forest towards the coast. The body of Tublat lay where it had fallen, for the people of Kerchak do not eat their own dead. The march was but a leisurely search for food. Cabbage palm and grey plum, pisang and citamine they found in abundance, with wild pineapple and occasionally small mammals, birds, eggs, reptiles, and insects. The nuts they cracked between their powerful jaws or, if too hard, broke by pounding between stones. Once old Sabor, crossing their path, sent them scurrying to the safety of the higher branches, for if she respected their number and their sharp fangs, they on their part held her cruel and mighty ferocity in equal esteem. Upon a low-hanging branch sat Tarzan directly above the majestic supple body as it forged silently through the thick jungle. He hurled a pineapple at the ancient enemy of his people. The great beast stopped, and turning, eyed the taunting figure above her. With an angry lash of her tail she bared her yellow fangs, curling her great lips in a hideous snarl that wrinkled her bristling snout in serried ridges, and closed her wicked eyes to two narrow slits of rage and hatred. With laid-back ears she looked straight into the eyes of Tarzan of the Apes, and sounded her fierce, shrill challenge. And from the safety of his overhanging limb the ape-child sent back the fearsome answer of his kind. For a moment the two eyed each other in silence, and then the great cat turned into the jungle, which swallowed her as the ocean engulfs a tossed pebble. But into the mind of Tarzan a great plan sprang. He had killed the fierce Tublat, so was he not there for a mighty fighter? Now would he track down the mighty Sabor and slay her likewise. He would be a mighty hunter also. At the bottom of his little English heart beat the great desire to cover his nakedness with clothes, for he had learned from his picture-books that all men were so covered, while monkeys and apes and every other living thing went naked. Clothes, therefore, must be truly a badge of greatness, the insignia of the superiority of man over all other animals for surely there could be no other reason for wearing the hideous things. Many moons ago, when he had been much smaller, he had desired the skin of Sabor the lioness, or Numa the lion, or Sheeta the leopard to cover his hairless body, that he might no longer resemble hideous Hista the snake. But now he was proud of his sleek skin, for it betokened his descent from a mighty race, and the conflicting desires to go naked in prideful proof of his ancestry or to conform to the customs of his own kind and wear hideous and uncomfortable apparel, found first one and then the other in the ascendancy. As the tribe continued their slow way through the forest after the passing of Sabor, Tarzan's head was filled with his great scheme for slaying his enemy, and for many days thereafter he thought of little else. On this day, however, he presently had other and more immediate interests to attract his attention. Suddenly it became as midnight. The noises of the jungle ceased. The trees stood motionless, as though in paralyzed expectancy of some great and imminent disaster. All nature waited, but not for long. Faintly from a distance came a low, sad moaning. Nearer and nearer it approached, mounting louder and louder in volume. The great trees bent in unison as though pressed earthward by a mighty hand. Farther and farther toward the ground they inclined, and still there was no sound save the deep and awesome moaning of the wind. Then, suddenly, the jungle giants whipped back, lashing their mighty tops in angry and deafening protests. A vivid and blinding light flashed from the whirling inky clouds above. The deep cannonade of roaring thunder belched forth its fearsome challenge. The deluge came. All hell broke loose upon the jungle. The tribe, shivering from the cold rain, huddled at the bases of great trees. The lightning, 
darting and flashing through the blackness, showed wildly waving branches, whipping streamers and bending trunks. Now and again some ancient patriarch of the woods, rent by a flashing bolt, would crash in a thousand pieces among the surrounding trees, carrying down numberless branches and many smaller neighbors to add to the tangled confusion of the tropical jungle. Branches, great and small, torn away by the ferocity of the tornado, hurtled through the wildly waving verdure, carrying death and destruction to countless unhappy denizens of the thickly peopled world below. For hours the fury of the storm continued without surcease, and still the tribe huddled close in shivering fear. In constant danger from falling trunks and branches, and paralyzed by the vivid flashing of lightning and the bellowing of thunder, they crouched in pitiful misery until the storm passed. The end was as sudden as the beginning. The wind ceased. The sun shone forth. Nature smiled once more. The dripping leaves and branches, and the moist petals of gorgeous flowers glistened in the splendor of the returning day. And so, as nature forgot, her children forgot also. Busy life went on as it had been before the darkness and the fright. But to Tarzan a dawning light had come to explain the mystery of clothes. How snug he would have been beneath the heavy coat of Sabor! And so was added a further incentive to the adventure. For several months the tribe hovered near the beach where stood Tarzan's cabin, and his studies took up the greater portion of his time. But always when journeying through the forest he kept his rope in readiness, and many were the smaller animals that fell into the snare of the quick-thrown noose. Once it fell about the short neck of Horta, the boar, and his mad lunge for freedom toppled Tarzan from the overhanging limb where he had lain in wait, and from whence he had launched his sinuous coil. The mighty tusker turned at the sound of his falling body, and, seeing only the easy prey of a young ape, he lowered his head and charged madly at the surprised youth. Tarzan, happily, was uninjured by the fall, alighting cat-like upon all fours, far outspread to take up the shock. He was on his feet in an instant, and leaping with the agility of the monkey he was, he gained the safety of a low limb as Horta, the boar, rushed futilely beneath. Thus it was that Tarzan learned by experience the limitations as well as the possibilities of his strange weapon. He lost a long rope on this occasion, but he knew that had it been Sabor who had thus dragged him from his perch, the outcome might have been very different, for he would have lost his life, doubtless, into the bargain. It took him many days to braid a new rope, but when finally it was done, he went forth purposely to hunt and lie in wait among the dense foliage of a great branch right above the well-beaten trail that led to water. Several small animals passed unharmed beneath him. He did not want such insignificant game. It would take a strong animal to test the efficacy of his new scheme. At last came she whom Tarzan sought, with lithe sinews rolling beneath shimmering hide. Fat and glossy came Sabor, the lioness. Her great padded feet fell soft and noiseless on the narrow trail. Her head was high in ever-alert attention, her long tail moved slowly in sinuous and graceful undulations. Nearer and nearer she came to where Tarzan of the Apes crouched upon his limb, the coils of his long rope poised ready in his hand. Like a thing of bronze, motionless as death, sat Tarzan. Sabor passed beneath. One stride beyond she took, a second, a third, and then the silent coil shot out above her. For an instant the spreading noose hung above her head like a great snake, and then, as she looked upward to detect the origin of the swishing sound of the rope, it settled about her neck. With a quick jerk Tarzan snapped the noose tight about the glossy throat, and then he dropped the rope and clung to his support with both hands. Sabor was trapped. With a bound the startled beast turned into the jungle, but Tarzan was not to lose another rope through the same cause as the first. He had learned from experience. The lioness had taken but half her second bound when she felt the rope tighten about her neck, 
her body turned completely over in the air, and she fell with a heavy crash upon her back. Tarzan had fastened the end of the rope securely to the trunk of the great tree on which he sat. Thus far his plan had worked to perfection, but when he grasped the rope, bracing himself behind a crotch of two mighty branches, he found that dragging the mighty, struggling, clawing, biting, screaming mass of iron-muscled fury up to the tree and hanging her was a very different proposition. The weight of old Sabor was immense, and when she braced her huge paws nothing less than Tantor, the elephant himself, could have budged her. The lioness was now back in the path where she could see the author of the indignity which had been placed upon her. Screaming with rage, she suddenly charged, leaping high into the air toward Tarzan, but when her huge body struck the limb on which Tarzan had been, Tarzan was no longer there. Instead he perched lightly upon a smaller branch twenty feet above the raging captive. For a moment Sabor hung half across the branch, while Tarzan mocked and hurled twigs and branches at her unprotected face. Presently the beast dropped to the earth again and Tarzan came quickly to seize the rope. But Sabor had now found that it was only a slender cord that held her, and grasping it in her huge paws, severed it before Tarzan could tighten the strangling noose a second time. Tarzan was much hurt. His well-laid plan had come to naught, so he sat there screaming at the roaring creature beneath him and making mocking grimaces at it. Sabor paced back and forth beneath the tree for hours, Four times she crouched and sprang at the dancing sprite above her, but might as well have clutched at the elusive wind that murmured through the treetops. At last Tarzan tired of the sport, and with a parting roar of challenge and a well-aimed ripe fruit that spread soft and sticky over the snarling face of his enemy, he swung rapidly through the trees, a hundred feet above the ground, and in a short time was among the members of his tribe. Here he recounted the details of his adventure, with swelling chest and so considerable swagger, that he quite impressed even his bitterest enemies, while Kayla fairly danced for joy and pride. End of chapter.